and this is Template Creation Power Forms. Jesse Morgan is your Senior Product Consultant providing this session. Jesse, feel free to begin. Perfect. Thank you, Carrie. Well, welcome back, everyone. Uh, hopefully, you all enjoyed the DocuSign 101 session uh, last week or have gone back to review the recording. Um, we're going to be building upon the concepts that we learned in DocuSign 101 today, or from last week, we're going to be uh, building upon those concepts today, rather. Uh, so what we talked about in DocuSign 101 was how to create an envelope. And if you remember what that envelope is in DocuSign, that's your single transaction. Is there a question? No, oh, okay. Um, so in DocuSign 101, we talked about an envelope. And an envelope is that single transaction that you put your documents into, you route it to different recipients if there's a workflow involved, and you have them interact with DocuSign fields when they open that document in their browser and they're viewing it in that signing ceremony. So you should all be familiar with those concepts uh, before uh, reviewing the session. Um, so what we're going to talk about today is DocuSign templates. Now a DocuSign template, unlike just a traditional document template, um, I'd like to provide some clarity about those terms. So a template in DocuSign is a reusable envelope. Unlike a document template where you might think of that as a Word document or a PDF that has some placeholders, so I went onto your website and I found a random form just for demonstration purposes today. So it might not be exactly how you might use this form, but again, this is really just to help illustrate some of the learnings that you're going to glean from today. So this would be considered a document template. But what we're going to do is we're going to take this document template and turn it into a DocuSign template. Now before we actually dig into showing you how to create a template and all of the little nuances and technical features and capabilities in that regard, what I like to do real quick at the very beginning, just like I did on the DocuSign 101 call where I created an envelope up front so you can kind of conceptualize where we're going today, I like to do the same thing for templates. So let me go ahead and create a couple envelopes in a couple different ways for you real quick up front so that you can kind of see where we're going and how a template can be used. So again, the things that we're going to talk about from a template standpoint make a little bit more sense. So I'm going to go ahead and click on this new button and send an envelope. Now instead of uploading a document from my machine, I'm going to choose this use a template option. Now the use case that I'm going to be using today with your student withdrawal form is going to be different than what I'm demonstrating right now. So bear with me here. But I have a, uh, let's see here, I have a PTO request, like a time off request uh, template already pre-built. So let's pretend an employee contacted me saying, hey, I need to take some time off. Can you send me that document to fill out so that I can sign it and have my manager sign it for approval? So I, the sender, can create an envelope, apply this request or time off request template, click Add Selected, and we can see here how essentially all the steps to create an envelope now are now completed for me for the most part, about 95%. So we can see here the document that I want to send out automatically got pulled in for me. My recipient workflow is already created, so I know as the sender that I need to provide the name and email for the employee here in this location and the name and email for the manager here in this location based upon these role names that are provided. And then once I do that, I'm just going to add myself for both of those. And also, a custom email message and uh, subject line have already been added. Some reminders and expirations already customized. And the wonderful thing is on this next page, all of those fields are already placed in advance for me. Signatures, dates, and you can see all these advanced fields we're going to talk about today. But really, very simple. I apply my template, and then I click Send, and my envelope is created very, very quickly. Now, another way a template can be used is if I go ahead and start a new envelope. The concept that I just showed you is how to use a template in, uh, in its fullest degree. So meaning we're pulling in the document and all of the template settings to create our envelope from scratch. Now if I go ahead and upload a document here from my computer, and it sounds like someone just put themselves on mute if you wouldn't mind muting yourselves, please. Thank you. All right, so if I go ahead and upload, let's just say, um, just for kicks and giggles, I just uploaded that student withdrawal form, so it's totally different. I don't have a template created for this document yet, but I can click on the little more options ellipsis underneath this uh, document image, 
click Apply Templates. And what I'm choosing to do here is to ignore the static placeholder document that's inside my DocuSign template. And instead, I'm telling DocuSign to overlay all of the other template settings from that template on top of this form that I just uploaded. So if I click Apply Template, and I go ahead and choose that same time off request form, Get rid of these pop-ups here. Again, you can see here the document is still the one I just uploaded, the withdrawal form. But you can see the workflow is what was for my time off request templates. The context of applying this template to this document doesn't make sense. However, I just wanted to point out that you can either use a template and the document that's within your DocuSign template, or you can apply your template settings on top of whatever other document you upload. So there's a couple different ways you can leverage templates. Now the last thing I want to show you up front before we begin building our template is from a self-service standpoint. We have a lot of customers where you have, uh, rather a lot of schools and universities, they have a lot of self-service type use cases. So whether that's a student withdrawal form, maybe it is a time off request uh, a use case where you need to request some PTO. But maybe you don't need a sender sending you an envelope manually and you having to request it. Maybe you just want to go onto your website, click into your forms library, click a link, type in your own name and email, and immediately begin signing the document via DocuSign with your electronic signature. All without a sender having to be involved, taking their time to send you an envelope. And that's what we call a power form. So the very, very last part of this call today, after we talk about templates, I'm going to take you through how to create a DocuSign power form. It might sound confusing, but essentially what a power form is, is it's a URL or a hyperlink that is dedicated or pointed to your DocuSign template. So the first step would be, we have to build our DocuSign template. That's why we cover that, the, that teaching first. Then we take our template and assign it a URL. That would be the power form for it to be self-service initiated. So that's why we're gonna cover that at the very tail end of this call. But let me demonstrate it for you real quick. So this PTO request probably makes sense for it to be a self-service use case, clicking on a link and requesting some time off, and then having it route to our manager for approval. So what I can do here is I'm going to go ahead and copy the URL, and I'm going to paste this in my browser, simulating what it'd be like clicking on it from, from the website. So we can see here, this looks like I'm creating an envelope, but it's just in a different user interface because this is self-service. So myself as the employee would provide my name and email here. And I also provide my manager's email. And then I click Begin Signing. And you'll see here, an envelope is now immediately created and I'm taken into the signing ceremony to fill out the document. And as soon as I click finish, once I've filled out all my fields, because I've already provided my manager's name and email, it would go automatically to them to countersign the manager portion of the document. Okay, so as you can see, there's a variety of ways of utilizing templates and it really is gonna be dependent upon the type of use case, the audience, if you need to be pre-filling data, if you need to have some more advanced special routing. So these are gonna be all decisions and conversations that you're gonna have internally or with yourselves when you're thinking through the templating process. So what I'm gonna show you today is the process of how to take a form, turn it into a DocuSign template, and walk you through just some best practices and questions that you wanna ask yourself along the way as you're doing so. Okay, so let's start from the home screen here. Let me do a refresh real quick. All right, so the first step is at the top of the screen, you'll click on your templates tab. And then on the left-hand side, there's a new button over here. This new button is different than the one you'll find on the home and the manage screen because this one is pertaining to templates. Now the first option is the one that you want. If you wanna simply take a document or forms and turn it into a DocuSign template, you're not gonna use this upload template function unless you're transitioning your template from one DocuSign environment to another. Because once you build your template here in let's say this demo sandbox environment, you can easily do all your testing here and then download it, export it, 
and then upload it into your production environment when you're comfortable and you're ready to use it and roll it out uh, permanently. And then we'll get to the PowerForm option later. So I'm going to choose Create Template. So the first step up top is giving our template a name. As you saw when I used the template earlier from a variety of different ways, your template name is the descriptor in how your users are going to know which template they need to use for certain purposes or scenarios. So let's give it a name here. Let's call this student draw form. Now, template description is optional, but I do recommend it because if you're out of the office or if, a, if you're busy or your manager needs to modify your template or even an admin, uh, this gives some good description notes as to maybe why you set up the template the way you did. Maybe you spent weeks getting approval to have a very specific workflow. And the last thing you want is someone to come in here and unintentionally make changes to the workflow if you've already done your due diligence to actually get it vetted out and approved, why let someone change it? Of course, if anyone else has uh, access to edit your template, they can make those changes. So it's good just to call it out in the description, maybe things that you want them changing versus not, uh, just so that way maybe they are a little bit more uh, careful with what they might do. Now you're going to notice that a lot of these steps are pretty similar to creating an envelope. And we actually use the same term envelope, and that can get confusing for newcomers to DocuSign. But if you think about it, it makes sense why we're using this term here, because a template is going to be used to create envelopes. So that's why we still use this term, because you still need to be thinking about it from an envelope creation standpoint. So I'm going to go ahead and upload my form. <clears throat> and just like an envelope, a template can contain one or many documents. It really depends upon the context and the use case. Now, we start getting into our recipients here. So you'll notice how we already have some new features that you probably didn't see when, uh, when you're creating an envelope. So I'm going to set up a signing order. But the first new thing that you don't see in an envelope is this role name. Now, when I demonstrated using the template earlier, you saw how the role name is, uh, serves as a visual prompt so the sender knows what name and email to put where. So, if this is a student drop form, I'm going to talk about some of these other roles and how we might handle that with like a self-service use case. But on the surface, this form looks pretty simple. It requires a student name, signature, some data that they're filling out. So we'll talk about the advanced workflow here in just a little bit. But let's just say on the surface, maybe we have a two-signer scenario. We have the student filling it out. Then maybe we have a final approval by someone at the registrar's office or student services or academic services. So I'm going to go ahead and add a role name of student, because we're going to want the sender to provide the student's name and email here. Or if it's self-service, the student will type it in there. Now under this dropdown, we already talked about the concept of the signer or recipient type. Uh, we talked about that in DocuSign 101. So I'm not going to belabor the points on needs to sign, in-person signing, or receives a copy. Those are fairly straightforward. Uh, but I did mention that I would give a little bit more descriptor, uh, descriptional information about these other advanced recipient role types. So these other recipient role types are great to use if you have more uh, ambiguous or just rather just complex uh, workflows. So maybe, for instance, uh, we have a contract that we need someone signing, but then maybe we have a holding period that we have to hold on to it before it is fully executed. So let's just say maybe after it's signed, we need to hold on to it and give uh, the signer 30 days to back out of that contract before it's executed and goes into full effect. What we can do with some of these advanced role types here, and I'm going to actually change this role name here just so we don't get confused with uh, some of my... Uh, example descriptions. Let's just call this signer 1 for now. We'll call this person signer 2. So let's just say we have that scenario where we need someone to view the document after signer 1 fills it out before it automatically routes to signer 2. So meaning, we can leverage needs to view. So that word needs is mandatory. So just like a certified delivery where you have to sign for the package before it's left with you, similar concept, but the envelope won't automatically route from one person to the next until you complete this needs to view action. 
So it is similar to a carbon copy, but you're forcing them to view it and it will not automatically move on uh, to the next person in line until this needs to view recipient literally views the document. So the way we'd set this up is if I make this person go in routing order three, click on add recipient, let's move this person to number two. And for lack of a better uh, description, I'm just gonna call this person an inter intermediary to someone in between our two signers. So if I go ahead and set up a workflow, something like this, then what this means is that when we're sending an envelope, signer one is gonna fill it out, but then it's gonna land with this intermediary to review it. And until they look at the document, it is not gonna route to signer two. <clears throat> so typically this role has been reserved for those types of contracts that need to go into a holding period. So then after you wait, say 30 days, if the first signer hasn't objected and withdrawn their consent to the document, then maybe this person can go in, view the document, at which point it would then route to signer two. So it puts a temporary pause on the workflow from auto progressing. The next one is specify recipients. Specify recipients is really nice and a lot of universities and colleges use this simply because it allows you to send the envelope to the the signers that you know in advance, but yet leave downstream recipients' names and emails blank because maybe you need to pause the envelope after a few people have touched it, filled out some uh, details on the document, and based upon the elections they've made or dollar amounts or whatever criteria, maybe that's going to determine who signer two or any of the downstream recipients are going to be. But in other words, you don't know who those approvers are in advance and you need to wait until the form's filled out before you can make that determination. So that's the way this would work, where the sender could send this to signer one. The sender would also specify who they want the envelope to pause with after signer one is done so they can review it. But this person's task as the intermediary would be to provide the missing name and email for any other recipients, recipients downstream after the specify recipient role. Now, update recipients is similar, but what it assumes is that the sender is providing all the names and emails for all the parties in the workflow, but it still allows them to review the envelope at a certain point. They'll get a notification, and if they determine, you know what, we originally assigned signer two to um, you know, uh, this main approver that generally approves 80% of our documents. Well, after you look at it and determine, hey, signer one made some weird selections on the document, maybe we need this other approver that has a little bit more authority. Maybe it's a VP or someone, you know, with, um, uh, again, with higher authority. So we need to actually update the recipients and change it from the original person that we assigned it to, to a new person. So that's what update recipients means, is that you're just simply updating recipient details from the original details that you originally provided. And then lastly is allow to edit. Now on DocuSign 101 last week, I showed you all how when you create an envelope and that envelope is still in process, meaning you don't have all signers completing their actions yet. When an envelope is still in process, you as the sender can perform what's called an envelope correction. Now, it doesn't mean you're correcting the document or the data on the document that's been filled out by a signer, but it does mean you're updating and correcting the envelope transaction at a whole. So that means if no one signed it yet, you could swap out the document entirely. If you forgot to add a document, you might be able to append on additional supplemental documents and add fields for them. And of course, it allows you to update recipient details and add or edit recipients, remove recipients, if um, depending upon the state that it's at in the workflow. So there's a lot of neat things you can do with the correction if for some reason you notice an error and you need to fix something in the envelope. So what allow to edit means is that you're allowed to grant out that type of correction capability to someone else of your choice, even if that other someone is not the original sender. So in this type of workflow, I'd have signer one fill out the document, and then I'd have a reviewer take a look at the document. And again, this is for those real, real confusing workflows. This is a great um, uh, recipient role type to leverage. So what this would allow you to do is review the document, and if you determine, you know what, I know we already specified that signer two is our approver. Well, maybe based upon how they fill it out, maybe we need 
two additional approvers, so a total of three. Well, we see when the envelope was created, we only had a second signature, but we didn't have signatures three and four that are required. So this allowed edit person could go in, correct the envelope, they could add the additional recipients that would be needed. Or to the inverse of that, what if they noticed, you know, hey, we're asking for three approval signatures, but this is a pretty simplistic way this person filled out the form, so maybe you only need one approver. In this correction mode or allow to edit mode, you can go in and remove recipients that you originally thought were needed but are no longer needed. So a lot of neat things you can do. Now the one catch to using allow to edit is that you have to, or sorry, the person that you're assigning this role to would have to have at least sender permissions or above, meaning they have to also be a DocuSign account user. So they would have to be a member of your account and they would have to have at least sender credentials or above. Because if you think about it, it makes sense. We're granting out sender correction permissions or controls. So therefore you have to have those types of permissions and capabilities in order for someone to allow you to correct an envelope. Okay, so that's the one caveat to using this. I'm gonna go ahead and delete that. Okay, so if I go ahead and click on this more dropdown, we've already talked about authentication and a private message, but just to talk about it from a templating standpoint, if you know that this use case that we are going to be uh, building the template for, or rather that we are building the template for, if we know that it's going to contain personally identifiable information, well then instead of putting the onus on the sender to have to determine if authentication is needed or not, let's make those decisions in advance and then lock them down so that if, if it has personally identifiable information on this use case and on the document, we wanna lock it down. So again, you're taking away the guesswork and you're making the envelope secure no matter what. So if I go ahead and click on access authentication, I can choose in advance which authentication method I would want for this recipient. So actually, now that we're done talking about generalities, I'm gonna go ahead and just update this real quick. Let's call this student. And for lack of a better term, I'm just gonna call this uh, approver. So what I can do here is click on this checkbox, require an access code for this recipient. And what this means is that at the template level, because we want the sender providing the name and email here for the student, or the student, student providing it themselves, I'm gonna leave that blank. Same thing here, uh, conceptually, kind of where we're going with this. So we wanna leave the access code blank at the template level, because we wanna have it be unique and have the sender communicate that to the recipient, again, making it secure. If we hard code an access code here at the template level, what you do risk is that anytime a sender uses this template, it's gonna apply that same access code. So over time, your students might learn, hey, uh, you know, if you wanna try and access this other student's envelope, the access code is this. They learn it as a shared secret, which could be a bad thing and is not very secure. So you wanna try and make sure access code is unique for every recipient in every transaction. Now you can also add a private message in advance. And the reason why you might do this is if you know that the sender is going to be having to type in the same instructions or the same canned message over and over again, well then let's do that in advance for them just to save them some keystrokes and time it takes to create an envelope. Again, the more things you can think of in advance to do or lock down or configure for the sender to save them time, the better. So what I might do in this scenario is let's just say if I do need an access code, I would go ahead and click require an access code. And if I know the sender is gonna have to type in a little password or sorry, an access code hint, I'll type that in here in advance. So something like that. So that saves them a lot of time, even though it's a pretty simplistic message. Again, you're just saving them as much time as you can. Okay. That was just for demonstration purposes. I am gonna go ahead and remove this for now. All right. 
Now, the other thing that you didn't see at the envelope level is these advanced settings. So if I go in and give this a click, what this allows you to do is lock down certain privileges, or rather grant or take away certain privileges, I should put it that way. So we're not really thinking about this from a, you know, hey, we don't trust our senders that's going to use this template type of standpoint. We're looking at this from a standpoint of, hey, we know our senders are busy because we're all busy. So we want to take away or allow some options if necessary, but we don't want the senders to accidentally click on the wrong thing and accidentally invalidate the workflow just simply because they were busy you know, they got, uh, you know, they were trying to do things a little too quickly and they clicked on the wrong thing and oops, I accidentally deleted that approver. And if they click send on the envelope without realizing it, they've essentially created an envelope and wasted it because you know you need both signatures when you get it back, but you've created the envelope with only one signature needed. So why would we, why would we want the sender to accidentally delete a recipient? So those are the types of questions that you'll ask yourself. So for instance, in this use case, if I know that my student signature is required and my approver signature is required or approval in general is required, I want to lock down both these settings. So for instance, under the student, I'll click the same options. I'm going to go ahead and lock down both settings. So the sender can't edit the student or the recipient. Rather, they couldn't change the recipient role type, nor would they be able to change like um, if you've already applied a specific authentication method, they wouldn't be able to change it to something else or remove it entirely. Also, they wouldn't be able to delete the recipient, meaning it would also delete the fields off the document. So if someone is mandatory, and if you've already configured the recipient to the exact way that you know it's going to meet your business requirements, then we recommend to lock that down. Now, for something like, actually, you know what? I'm going to lock that down. I'm going to throw out a different example here. So what if we have a carbon copy that's optional? Sometimes you might have an additional person you want to CC. Other times, you might not. So what I like to do here is, under these advanced settings, is I don't want my sender to change this person to a signer if I know that these are the only two signers involved. But I do want to offer the sender the ability to carbon copy someone else if needed. So what I want to do is say, hey, don't edit the recipient and the options that I've chosen here. However, if I leave the delete option unchecked, because again, you can use these two settings interchangeably. But if I leave delete unchecked, what that means is that if the sender doesn't want to carbon copy anyone, they would have the ability to delete this recipient by clicking this little X. Whereas up here for these recipients, we took away the delete option, so they wouldn't see the little X on the right. So again, it just allows them to either add the name and email to carbon copy someone, or if they, worst case, they realize that there's no one to carbon copy, let's let them remove them. Okay, there's a lot of options here in DocuSign, as you can see. We're very, very modular. <laughs> uh, we try to accommodate every vertical, every type of business use case that we possibly can for every customer. And so there are a ton of options and a lot of uh, information to digest. So if you're just a sender and you're not aware of all the capabilities, you could accidentally click the wrong thing just inadvertently, maybe not even purposefully. So really, that's why you want to approach it from this angle. Okay, now moving on down to our messaging. We want to craft the subject line because remember, the subject line becomes the name of your envelope. That's what you're identifying uh, the certain transactions when you're getting the email notifications. Um, or if you're monitoring the envelopes here in the web application, you're looking by the envelope subject line. So again, we recommend that you have unique subject line naming conventions. So if you want your sender creating the subject line and adding in something unique so it's, it's uh, easily identifiable or searchable in certain contexts, then you might want to allow them to do that. Now you can also do this in advance to try and save them time, which is encouraged, especially if they forget to modify it. You want to have some sort of catch-all or baseline default. So let's go ahead and rename this. Let's just call this UTRGV student withdrawal. Now what I like to do to add some uniqueness is add the word for 
and another space. And you'll notice over here on the right hand side at the template level we have a merge field. So if I click on this little gray arrow, notice how it's pulling in my different recipient role names from above, the student, approver, and my optional carbon copy. What I can do is go ahead and say click on the insert the student's name. Now it looks you know, kind of weird right now, but don't worry about that because when the sender actually uses this template to create an envelope, and whatever full name they type in here for this role of the student, we're going to take that full name and replace this merge field with that full name. So it, it almost makes it a dynamic behavior in a way. It'll merge that in for you. And same thing for the body message we might want to have, just something a little bit more uh, personal down here pre-created. Now under advanced options, I did mention that we'd uh, come back and talk about some of these settings here. So uh, we're not going to get really into too many best practices because ultimately the determination of if, you, if you're going to be using some of these settings or if you're even going to have some of them available to you is really going to be up to your business leaders and uh, or rather your DocuSign administrators from a business requirement standpoint, which features may or may not be available. So what you see on the screen here may not be an exact one-to-one -to, -one to what you see when you log in and look at these advanced options, so just FYI. But do we want to allow recipients to print a document out, sign on paper, essentially they're bypassing electronic signature and you're simply using DocuSign to route the document electronically. So if they print it out and wet sign it, the things that you lose is our ability to validate if the fields have been filled out correctly. Also, we can't even guarantee that any of the data has been filled out. They could have just drawn a picture of a cat on the document and faxed it or uploaded it back, and then we're just going to route it on to the next person. There's really no checks and balances that we can invoke and leverage if you're choosing to allow them to bypass DocuSign. So again, you'll want to ask, uh, or sorry, defer to your um, leadership about whether or not you'd be leveraging this feature. Changing signing responsibility. Uh, this would be uh, leveraged if Let's just say I send the envelope to Carrie, and then Carrie looks at it and says, you know what, I need my manager, Derek, to sign this instead. That allows Carrie to click on a button in the signing ceremony, click on assign to someone else, and then she could type in Derek's name and email, type in a brief reason why she's reassigning it to Derek, and then click reassign, at which point she can no longer sign the document, but now Derek has got a notification with a new link, and when he clicks on it, he'd be signing as himself. So it allows the signer, or the recipient rather, to reassign signing responsibility. And so that's what this setting is uh, describing. Now we also have advanced features that you may or may not have enabled, like document visibility. Do we want to pick and choose which recipients in the workflow can interact with certain documents? Just keep that in your back pocket. I'm not going into depth on how to control that today, but we do have that capability in DocuSign. So depending upon the use case, you may want to have certain settings configured in certain ways, depending upon the context and your business requirements. Now, same thing for reminders and expirations. You might have some baseline defaults that your admin has set in your account for you, and they may be grayed out. If they're grayed out, then there's really not much you can do other than maybe put in a request to your admin to modify the settings. However, if you are able to modify them like I can here, you'd want to pick and apply the settings as it pertains to your use case. So who is the audience that we're sending the envelopes to? Are they going to be, um, you know, are they going to be sensitive about us bugging them frequently with uh, frequent reminders if they don't sign right away? Or uh, should we space them out? Or is it an audience where maybe they're super busy and they appreciate the, the frequent reminders and they actually want that because they know their inbox gets buried with hundreds of emails per day? So let's bug them a little bit more frequently if it's okay. Right? But those are all decisions that you'll make on a use case by use case level or basis. So how many days do we want to wait before sending out the first reminder? Maybe I'll wait a couple days. And then I'll set the reoccurrence here. And then we also need to think about expiration. For this type of use case and document, when we send it out today via paper or through PDF and an email or a link, when do we expect to get it back? We would want to apply those same settings and same logic here, because if we're not going to honor it after a certain point in the paper scenario, 
why would we honor it after a certain point in the electronic scenario? So those same decisions are still going to apply. All right, now you can also password protect your template. The thing here is this password can be reset by admins if they need to, but uh, if you're not an admin, let's just say you, you're on a team with other users that have template creation permissions. What that means is that even though you might create this template, if others have access to this template and they have template creation rights, that means they can also edit your template without your permission, unless you add a password. Now, not all customers use a password. Again, you'll want to defer to your admins and your uh, leadership about whether or not you should be setting passwords on your templates. But the best practice that I will give you that if you are going to password protect templates, make sure, please make sure that it's not a password that you use for any other service or application. You want to make sure that it's a password that is unique to this template and not any other template or any other services you log into because you might need to share that password with a colleague if, say, you're out of the office, they need to modify your template, you're going to have to share your password with them. So in order to make sure that you stay secure, you're not sharing private information, make sure that it's something you know, unique to DocuSign and this template so that you're not granting out permissions to other applications. Some universities also have different branding, so different logos and color scheme combinations. Others have just one where it's kind of a default for the entire account. So again, that'll be another thing you'll defer to your leadership in terms of uh, what you should be using. But you can see here in advance, I can pick and choose certain templates so that when this template is used, the right logo and color scheme are automatically applied. Now, template modification, this is taking away those privileges that I was talking about uh, when we were looking at the recipients. So in the background here, under those advanced settings where we don't allow the sender to edit the recipient or delete recipient, I customize this at a granular level because I locked down my two signers pretty firmly, whereas the carbon copy I left optional where it can be deleted or uh, they can add the name and email. Under these advanced options down here, if I click Edit, these are kind of like a blanket setting for this entire template, meaning we wouldn't be configuring it at the recipient level and getting pretty granular the way I did it. This is locking down the recipient so that a sender cannot edit, add, or remove recipients. So this would be the strictest setting. I recommend typically to, to uh, do it at the recipient level because uh, you may end up in a scenario where, where you're trying to use the template, trying to make some adjustments and can't figure out why you can't do something, and you forget that you set this setting here in the template modification controls. <clears throat> also, it allows you to get a really more granular in terms of the workflow, and you can configure it um, how you so choose per recipient. But sometimes this is very applicable. Now, same thing here for the messaging. You can lock that down, and also the branding selection. So we're almost uh, completed with this page, but under template usage, what I can also do is decide how do I want this template to be used. For now, just to give you uh, just a quick way to create your template without having to think too hard about this, I recommend just leaving it on this first setting only. Uh, what the quick send means is typically if we want the user to use this template to create an envelope and we only want to pull in the document sitting at the DocuSign template level, that's what the quick send would be used for. So let me rewind. At the very beginning of this call, I demonstrated how you'd use a template in a variety of ways. The first way, when I click Use a Template, it pulled in the document from the template and also all my other template settings. If I want to force the user to only use that version of the document, the placeholder that's in my template, then I'm going to choose the quick send only option. However, if I want the sender to be able to upload a document from their computer and apply a template on top of it, or maybe I want to give them the option to be able to add additional documents uh, from their computer if they maybe need to add supplemental documents, then I want to choose the advanced edit option. So for now, just so that you don't confuse yourself in terms of how you might need to use it, that's why I recommend using both options by allowing quick send and advanced edit. So that way you kind of are able to build your template, 
do your testing, figure out how you want users to use your template. And remember, your template, you can always come in here and edit and update and enhance it yourself. So you can always come in here and tweak these settings to your liking later on. And then lastly, do we want to allow commentary? So comments is that kind of sidebar communication a quasi instant chat capability that signers can have to uh, to interact with each other in that signing ceremony. So if they have a question about a clause or terms and conditions or something on the document, let's let them click on a little chat bubble and ask their question in semi real time while they're looking at the document. Otherwise, they'll have to pick up a phone or send you an email to get the clarification they need. So you might want to just play with comments if it's a feature that's going to be made available to you. Again, that's going to be at the discretion of your DocuSign administrator. Okay, so now the next step is we go ahead and click on our next button, and this will take us to the tagging screen. If you see this pop-up, this is actually really good news. Don't click off of it because you won't get it back. What this is, is it's a way of uh, DocuSign actually has recognized that this form that I uploaded, this PDF, had PDF form fields or Adobe form fields already added to it. So someone already took the time to add Adobe fields to this document, which is great because what DocuSign can do is we can pick up those Adobe fields, convert them, and transform them into DocuSign fields for you. So if I go ahead and click Assign To, and I pick the recipient that I want to assign those fields to, and then click Confirm, you'll actually see all the fields automatically placed on the document for me. Now the onus is still on me to go through and make sure that all the settings for each field are correct. Should they be optional or required? If I want the student name here, do I really want them typing it in, or do I want to replace it with our full name field to add it automatically? Same with the date. If I want them typing in today's date, accidentally typing in last year's uh, date, <laughs> or do I want to use our date signed field to apply today's current date? So again, all questions that you'd have to ask yourself. I'm actually going to avoid this option right now because I want to teach you what all the different fields are so that you're prepared to turn any template or a document into a DocuSign template, even if it's not a PDF document like that. Okay, so the concept of dragging and tagging that you learned in DocuSign 101 still applies. So what we're going to be doing is instead of placing fields by the recipient's name like you do in an envelope, that's the other purpose of the role name. You'll see when I click in this drop down, I'm placing the fields by the role name and that's making sure it's assigned to the correct to the uh, correct signer. So let's go ahead and just start walking through some of these fields, and I'm going to try and go in order, but I may jump around a little bit, so uh, definitely bear with me here. If I go ahead and scroll on down, we need a student signature. And you'll notice that when I drop a field on the document, I get a property menu that pops open to the right. I showed you that in DocuSign 101, but we're going to really be deep diving into some of these properties today. And when I click off of the field, that property menu goes away click back onto it, it returns. So what I'm doing is I'm, I'm adjusting the field settings or the field properties for this specific field. So on the right hand side, I can determine do I want it being required or optional by simply unchecking it. So you can tell any field that has the color around it, that the color is just going to tell you which recipient it's assigned to, of course. But the white background means it's optional, because when I change it to required, you can see it turns back into that color translucent background. Now under formatting, there's not much I can do for a signature field, but I can scale it to a different percentage depending upon the size in which I need it sitting on my document. We're going to talk about data labels because this is going to be a crucial aspect to building templates. Um, this is especially important if, uh, especially if your leadership or admins tell you to start applying data labels, because maybe they're starting to think, uh, do some forward thinking about, are we going to have a DocuSign integration? Or will we need to be exporting data from DocuSign into, say, CSV files, which can be done in a variety of ways? And the column header names in those CSV files when you export data are your data labels. So if we have like a text box on our form, we want to give it a clear and concise data label so that it gives you context and you know what 
field that that value is contained in. Okay, so it'll make more sense once we uh, start digging into some of these other fields. The tooltip is great if you want to give some brief instructions to your signer. So if I were signing this document and hovered or clicked onto this field, the tooltip is a little blurb that pops up right above it where I can add some additional instructions or context that maybe might not be on your document and that you do want being visible. Okay, so maybe for a signature field, I can say, please click here to sign. The location is just gonna show you where exactly this field is located from a pixel XY coordinate standpoint on your document. So it's so many pixels over from the left, so many from the top, which is great for fine-tuned placement if you wanna really get granular. I could say, you know what, I want this to be 101 pixels from the left. And you can see it's slightly moved over. The other nice thing is we also have auto place functionality. I'm not going to demonstrate how to uh, set this up on today's call, but let me just give you a very, very high level description. Auto placement is great if you have documents that are dynamic, meaning maybe you have a Word document that you're going to be customizing and putting in some custom terms and conditions or um, services that are being uh, delivered or whatever it might be. But at the end of the day, maybe sometimes when you send out that document, the signatures are at the bottom of page one. But then if you have to really get verbose and you have to uh, really edit the document and customize it a lot, maybe those signatures will scoot down to page two or three in some context or some scenarios. So what auto placement can do is it allows you to anchor your fields to certain existing text on your document so that if the pagination changes on your form, DocuSign can automatically reposition or relocate the field for you. So if the signature moves from page one to page three in certain scenarios, we will automatically relocate it for you so the sender doesn't have to drag and drop it downward. Okay, so that's as much as I'll mention that on this call. Sender permissions. Now we already talked about that from this angle here under recipients when we looked at these advanced settings. Don't allow senders to edit recipient or delete recipient. This is pertaining to recipient controls. This is pertaining to field controls. So if I want to make sure my sender doesn't make any changes to where this field is located, changing the tooltip, changing my formatting, or if it being a required field, I want to restrict changes. So again, this goes back to some of the thinking that you're going to want to ask yourself, um, or questions, sorry. Uh, you know, so if we get this document back, is this signature mandatory? If it's missing a signature, can we still process it? If the answer is no, then again, why would we allow the sender to accidentally make this an optional field where you risk the person that you're delivering it to not signing it? So again, you'll ask yourselves those questions. And also mandatory. Do we want them being able to click on this field and clicking delete and removing it entirely? So again, going back to that question, if we get back a document missing the data, does that matter, yes or no? If the answer is yes, it does matter, we need it, then let's make it mandatory. And you can even still use these interchangeably. You don't have to use them both together. So that's just a little bit of best practice there for you. Now, if you need initials, same settings apply. You're just asking for initials instead of a full name signature, but all the settings are identical. We also have a stamp feature. The stamp is great if you need someone reviewing the document and approving it, but instead of them scribbling a name or a short set of initials, maybe we want them uploading an image so almost like a, a rubber stamped image, just, just so you visually know someone has laid their eyes on the document and approved it. That's essentially what a stamp is there for. So they're still electronically signing the document via the audit trail. However, on the document, you're just gonna see whatever image they've decided to stamp at that location. Date signed, you've already learned in DocuSign 101 that this applies to today's date when the recipient is signing and finishes the document. Oops, and I actually realized I put that in the wrong spot. And let me shrink down the signature there a little bit. So something like name as well, these are merge fields. So name and email are automatically just going to pull in those details from the recipient information. So that's going to be the details that the sender provides when they're sending the envelope. 
company and title, we are not going to pre-fill those unless we know that data. Otherwise, it's just going to be fillable text boxes. But what I like to spend a, a little bit of time on this call really focusing on is a lot of these other advanced fields that a lot of different colleges and universities leverage for their various templates. So I identified this form from your website because it looked like it had a good mix of different types of fields, or rather um, fields that could be needed that could accommodate most of these. So let's just go ahead and start with, say, like the, the text box. So I'm assuming right here this is asking for the student ID number, which probably we want it to be a fillable text box for the student to type in their ID number. So I'll drag over a text box. And we can grab these little dots on the corner to resize it to the size of our line here. And you see the grayed out word text. Don't worry, that's not going to be on your document. Same thing here where it says full name or date sign. This is just here to help you visually know when the recipient is done filling out the document and we complete it and we burn all the text onto your form. That's the location of where that text is going to go. So even though the background looks like it's lined up with the line, don't pay attention to that. That's why these fields are translucent. So you can see exactly how the text is going to line up. So if you want it right on the line, it's probably going to be overlapping your line a little bit like that. So over on the right with the text box, what I like to show you here is we have a ton of different features uh, to modify for text boxes. So the first being, um, we can make fields read only. So as the sender, if I'm sending this document out and I'm pre-filling the student ID here, If I want it to not be interactive and have the student be able to change it, I would select Read Only. So then when they get it, they would only be able to read it. They wouldn't be able to change the information. So that's really up to you if you're pre-filling data if you want to make it Read Only. Now, also you want to think about the character limit. How many characters do we want to allow? If you don't have this fixed width option selected in formatting, the field is going to auto-expand. So if the person wants to type in 4,000 characters, you can imagine this could spill off the end of the page or it could just automatically um, just truncate itself in the document if we have fixed width enabled. So right here, I have fixed width. It's not going to auto expand, but I'm still allowing 4,000 characters. So that would be where it would truncate itself and it would look like that data just cuts off right at this point, even though we'll capture the full response. So again, you kind of want to be smart with how you set this up. And we only want to allow as many characters that will fit inside the box. So you'll want to make sure that you probably play around with it and set a limit that makes a little bit more sense. Probably 15 characters would probably do it for this one. Now you also notice we have hide text with asterisks. So what this means is if I give that a click, you can see here how we will mask the data value here on the form itself so it's not visible to any party but you can still see we're holding the real value. Now this is important to know about, again, for like integration or data export purposes. You can export the data from an envelope and see the real value. You can leverage our APIs to send those real values back to your databases without them being masked or hidden. But still, if you need to share the PDF with someone, you know you're obfuscating or hiding uh, sensitive, personally identifiable information. Now going down to our data label, again, what we want to do is if I needed to export this uh, envelope later on into a CSV file, all the data, basically I need to do a data dump so that I can import it maybe into my accounting software. What I want to do is make sure that I have a clear and concise data label so that there's clear mapping or it's helping giving me context what this value is. So our recommendation is always delete the default data label and replace it with your own. Again, whatever your leadership or developers or DocuSign admins uh, request you to put in here. So for something like this, I might call this student ID number. Okay, now the tooltip, remember the tooltip is different. So the tooltip is gonna be the instructions presented to your signer when they're filling out the document.
And sometimes it's helpful in the tooltip to give them an example format if you're looking for a very specific format. Okay, so now I've made some really um, granular customizations to this field. So if I were having to crank out 10, 15 templates similar to this where I need to have a text field asking for the student ID number on every one of those, the last thing I want to do is go through and have to reinvent the wheel and recreate this field for every single template. So you probably noticed this gray button in the lower right hand corner, save as custom field. What I did originally is I drug over this text box from our standard fields column. There's these icons on the left hand side. So when you drag over something from the standard fields, these are default fields just out of the box, but you have to configure them to your liking every single time, which could be good for your very first template and that's perfectly fine. However, you'll notice there's also little icons if like the next one down is custom fields with this little wrench. If I click on that, I'm taken to my custom fields menu. So these are gonna be custom fields that either I have created or you created. It could be custom fields that your admin has created in advance for users on the account. But typically you're gonna go by the naming convention of which field you need for your template. So what I wanna do is I wanna save this field that I've already spent time on creating. I wanna save it to my custom fields so that if I'm creating a new template, I can just drag and drop it from my custom fields and all these customizations are already done for me. So all I need to do is click on save as custom field. Notice how we take the original data label but we still append on this unique identifier. Please go ahead and get rid of that. And then the only other thing that you'll wanna to defer to your admins about is whether or not you should be using the shared checkbox. This just means that by me saving this as a custom field and sharing it, that other users can also drag and drop this same field onto their documents and their templates. Okay, so typically sharing it is a good thing, but again, defer to your team as in terms of the best practice uh, for your university. So I'll click save, and now you'll see over here on the left that I now have a student ID number box. And if I go ahead and drag that over, you'll see how it's identical size and when I look over on the right hand side, you'll see all the same properties I've automatically applied, character limits, fixed width, my unique data label, tooltip. Okay, so it maintained all of those customizations, which is perfect. Now, the other thing to point out here is a cool feature that DocuSign has called data replication. So if you have two fields of the same type, for example, I have two text boxes, that would be the same type of field and I have them both sharing the exact same data label name. What this means is that if they type in a value into the first box or the second box, we're gonna automatically replicate that data into all the other fields that have the same name. So this is really nice to know about. So if you're, if you're creating a template that has a document or multiple documents, or maybe you're asking for the student or faculty or whomever to enter say like their street address, or student or faculty IDs, et cetera. And you're asking for that same information on document after document, all within the same envelope or within the same template. Let's avoid having the signer, because, uh, sorry, let's have, avoid having the signer having to type in that same information over and over and over again. That's a really bad user experience. So instead, if you have a data label, two fields of the same type sharing the same data label, they type it into one, it's gonna just carry over into all the other fields, name the same thing. Okay, so really cool thing to know about. <clears throat> Actually, I can delete that one there. So I'm gonna to talk to you about some other properties here as soon as I minimize some of these things. Okay, so validation. Validation is if you want to enforce some, or a very specific format. So if you have a text box and you want them to type in, say, their social security number, this is gonna accept the two main popular social security formats, um, whether it's just a full string of numbers or that also allows like three digits, dash, two digits, dash, four digits. Email, it only accepts valid email formats, numbers only, letters only, date, zip codes, 
And we also have the capability that if you want to get a little bit more technical, you might need to defer to your DocuSign admins um, or more IT experts in-house on how to do this. DocuSign can also provide a little bit of guidance on this. But you can apply custom regex patterns. A regex pattern is short for a regular expression pattern. Basically, it's a, it's a fancy way of saying it's a custom validation rule where we can specify via a regex pattern what we're looking to validate. So what format do we want to enforce? And if the signer doesn't enter in the data value into the format that we're seeking, we can throw a custom error message. So let me throw out a uh, what if scenario. Uh, what if we have a field, like, and I already have one created here called a phone number. So we need the student or someone here to enter a phone number. This is an example of a regex pattern for a phone number. And here's my custom error message. So if they don't enter in their format into either this standard US uh, phone number format or this standard US form phone number format with the parentheses, we're going to kick back this error asking them to update the entry that they made and put that phone number into the format we're looking for. Now, the reason why you'd want to be looking at this or start thinking about this from a templating standpoint is from consi for uh, consistency purposes. So moving forward, if you want to make sure that every document you get back moving forward has the data, not only that you need and, and you're able to mandate it um, via DocuSign required field, but also let's have consistency that it's formatted the same for every transaction. So there's no more guesswork from document to document, maybe what one signer meant versus another signer meant. Okay, so again, let DocuSign help out with that consistency as well. All right, now we also have collaboration capabilities. What collaboration means is that even though this field is required in this scenario for the student to fill out their student ID, if I allow collaboration by turning that on, what I'm allowing is anyone in the workflow to make edits to that data. So signer one, in this case, the student would fill out their ID. Then when it gets to the approver, if the approver notices that, hey, that student ID is off by one digit, they could click into that field and correct the student ID, even though normally they would not have access to that field or data if you didn't have collaboration turned on. Okay, so in some use cases, this is useful. Now, the one caveat that I do want to mention right up front, and you should put a, uh, put a pin in this or an asterisk if you're taking notes, collaboration cannot be used with those self-service power forms. Um, I can get into the technical whys on a different session if you're really curious, but it's just not a feature that plays friendly with, uh, with PowerForms. There are some workarounds that we can talk about, so if you do need collaboration for self-service use cases, we'll definitely want to chat about that in a separate session with you, uh, just so you understand some of the more caveats and in and outs, and that you'll also want to do some testing. Okay, so I'll just mention that, and, and I'll leave it at that. But if you are going to use collaboration, you can also then mandate that any changes require initials. So in this case, if the approver made a change, it would have to go backwards to the student to review the change and approve it by dragging and dropping their initials somewhere on the document, ideally probably in the margin. We can also make it a required field for all signers. So remember, we're assigning it to a person up above, to a, to a recipient, and we're making it required or optional for them. But this setting down here is asking, okay, well, when the collaborators are able to interact with the field, do you want it being a required field, meaning they can't simply erase what the student entered and leave it blank, they have to replace it with something, or we make it unrequired. So that would mean, in this case, the approver could simply click into this field, erase the student ID, and leave it blank, and you can end up with a document at the end of the day that's missing this data. So again, you'll ask those, yourself those questions, is it really important that we get a final document back with this data, yes or no? If yes, we want to make it required for all signers. And again, you can use those settings interchangeably. Conditional logic. So conditional logic is if you wanted to create like an if-then scenario. So for example, if you click this, 
then this field appears. Or if you enter in this specific value, then this other subsequent field appears. So as an example, uh, let's see here if I can find a good one. Actually, I didn't see any, con actually, you know, I do have a sample for conditional logic. So we'll come back to this uh, conditional logic here in just a minute once we talk about radio buttons and check boxes. Okay, and I already talked about sender permissions, so, okay. So the next field is checkboxes. Now the difference between checkboxes and radio buttons, this gets really easily confused for newcomers to DocuSign, and that's okay. Uh, checkboxes are really meant for multiple selections. So do we want to make sure that the, that the um, signer is able to select all the options that apply, or do we want to make sure they select a minimum of so many choices or a maximum of so many choices? But on the surface, you just need to remember checkboxes are really designed for multiple selections. Whereas radio buttons is designed to give you a group of choices to choose from, but you can only pick one of those choices out of the entire group. So kind of like a drop down menu in a different way, but that's how you'll decide which one you want to use. So I was looking at this form here and I see that all of the following must be acknowledged. So it looks like the student has to check all of these boxes. So because they have to check potentially all of them, these would be great candidates for check boxes. Whereas right here for the reason to withdraw, they're probably, it says reason, not plural, reasons. So I'm probably assuming you select one out of the grouping. Again, just some guessing. So for the radio button, what I'd want to do is I can drag over a radio button, drop it right there. And you can already see that we give you two options by default. So I can go ahead and drag over the second radio button where it needs to go. But I need four other ones. So I wouldn't drag over a new one because I want those options being part of this same group. So that's why I'm going to click this blue plus sign and add additional radio buttons to this group. And then just redrag them where they need to go. Okay. Now when I have all these fields aligned horizontally like this, maybe I want to do some alignment. What I can do is if I use my mouse just to hover over some empty white space on my document and hold down the left mouse button, I can lasso these multiple fields. And when you do a multi-select, you'll notice that you have some grouping options up above. You can align left, right, top, or bottom. In this case, I want to align them to the top, just get them looking nice. So now with radio buttons, the other thing you want to do over here on the right-hand side is we want to give it a data label. The only difference here, or the quirk, is that we call it a group label because these choices are grouped together. So same concept, though, we give it a label. So I would call this reason for withdrawal. And then I need to give each radio button a value. So again, if I'm ever exporting the data into your system or into a CSV file, you know exactly which option was selected. So the column header would say reason for withdrawal. And if I select academic difficulty, right now if I exported this to a CSV, it would just say radio one. So you have no context, like what is radio one? What option do they select? So that's why you really wanna be careful, or rather uh, spend the time adding unique values here. Okay, so now I've set up my radio button group. Now I see this option of other. Typically when I see this on a form, a lot of times you want them to type in what that other value is. So instead of them just selecting other and leaving it as is and you having to guess, well, what other reason is it? Is there? Let's ma make it mandatory and conditional to, uh, to, f to fill it in. So where I'm going with this is I'm gonna drag over a text box over here and I'm just making up a scenario. I don't know if you require this on this form right now, but that's okay. Because what, what I really want to illustrate and show you is how to set up conditional logic. So if they choose any of these other first categories, this text box will not appear and won't be required, of course. But if they select other, then we want this text box appearing and being required. 
So all I need to do to set up conditional logic is uh, first I need to figure out which field is the trigger field, meaning what field in its choice is going to trigger this field. Well, if you think about it, it's going to be the selection of one of these radio buttons, specifically the other. So I click on my trigger radio button group. And over here on the right hand side, I then click on conditional logic and this create rule button. So I have two steps and very simple. I want this text box shown. So all I need to do is click on it once and you can tell it's selected by those little stripes going through it. And then at the top, I'm just specifying which value is going to essentially trigger the field. So remember, it's going to be the selection of other. Now this goes back uh, to my, to my um, uh, best practice of applying a data label and your field values. If you're not naming your fields correctly, setting up conditional logic, formulas, all of that also becomes impossible to do. So that's why you really want to spend time labeling your fields. Because as you can see here, I'm able to very, very clearly specify if other is selected, I want this field shown. Otherwise, it would have just said radio 1, radio 2, radio 7, etc. And then I'll click done. So great. So now conditional logic is set up. It's pretty simple to do. Now for checkboxes, you drag these over one at a time. Now you can also group checkboxes. So for example, if I click on this plus sign, I can go ahead and do the same thing. But the concept here is you're not going to force them to just choose one. If you wanted to do that, we would do that with a radio button. But what I can do over here on the right hand side for checkboxes is under my group label, oops, sorry, uh, group tooltip, you can add instructions there. Checkbox values, we'd want to make sure each checkbox has a unique value as well. So like, uh, let's just do I understand one, understand two. You can call these whatever you like. I'm just doing this for simplicity purposes. Um, but under validation, this is what I wanted to point out. So you can choose some different validation rules for checkboxes. So select at least so many, or select at most, select exactly, select a range. So you can get very specific. Um, if you don't need to have any of these uh, requirements, then you can say select at least zero, just kind of leave it as is. We want them selecting all of them. So what I want to do, because it says all of the following must be acknowledged in order to process with your which well request. So in order for us to process this request, we need to make these mandatory. So what I want to do on the right hand side is I want to say select at least four. And that number four is pulled from how many rec uh, checkboxes we have assigned in this group. So right now, they would not be able to finish signing the document unless they've selected all four of these. And I'd probably want to do the same thing for this grouping down here if they're uh, receiving financial aid. So you probably have a question on your form, ideally, you know, are you receiving financial aid, yes or no? Then use conditional logic to trigger the fields, make them required if they are receiving financial aid. If they select no, that they're not receiving financial aid, then why would we force these fields to be required? Okay, so again, those will be all questions that you ask yourself as you're going through uh, your individual templates. Drop-down menus are great for things that are repeatable, uh, meaning, and things that we just want to give people a list value to select whatever value they want. Um, so for example, like a state drop-down, if you're having them fill out an address, if you use a text field, you run the risk of them abbreviating it sometimes, spelling it out in full, misspelling, Right, so you can end up in some problematic areas. But if you use a drop-down menu, you're giving them a list of options, and you have consistent formatting moving forward for whatever value they select. So it could be a department list drop-down. And what I even thought of for this form for the term or year, we could have a drop-down that shows the term. We have a drop-down for the year, and they select whichever is appropriate. So maybe let's have two drop-downs here, maybe one. Right there, we call this one the term. And let's do fall, uh, winter, spring.
spring and summer. And again, you can build your list interchangeably. You don't have to just use the list option. If you already have a, um, like a notepad or an Excel document with your values, copy and paste it and just make sure it's uh, a semicolon delimited. And again, for something like a drop-down menu, this is probably something you'd want to save as a custom field so that others that might need to use these fields won't have to recreate it. Let's just call this term and shared. Okay, and then I'd probably want to do something like that for the year. So let's call this one year. Okay. However many choices you want to give them. All right. So that's a little bit about some more of these advanced fields. Now also, you'll probably notice that I have a field called payments uh, that's lit up over here. You may or may not have access to this, um, but we have a whole other um, uh, advanced template training uh, that we do offer for many different colleges and universities where we go over things like document visibility, advanced conditional logic, auto placement, and we can even talk about payments as part of that agenda if there's any interest in it. So what I like to do is just give a high level description so payments would be a great way of syncing, or, or sorry, setting up your DocuSign account with a merchant gateway of your choice. So for instance, maybe some, uh, or rather some universities and colleges have use cases like where maybe the students have to pay um, certain fees for like a certain field trip or a learning opportunity outside of the campus. Um, or it could be faculty needing to pay some sort of faculty uh, semester fees or something like that. Right? Whatever the use case is where you have uh, your signer that you want to make sure that they initiate payment before they're allowed to complete signing their document, you can force that through a DocuSign payment field. So we can say, hey, dear student, before you're allowed to finish signing this document, we need to make sure that you've at least uh, initiated payment through PayPal to pay your $25 student fee for the semester. They make their payment, at which point it allows them to click the Finish button on the DocuSign document. So it kind of forces them to make that or initiate the payment before allowing them to finish. So I won't belabor that point anymore. just wanted to point out what you're seeing here. Now we also have formulas. So I don't have an exact example here on this form to set up a formula, but I'm just going to uh, create one here real quick. So what if my use case was something like, uh, let me go to my documents, let me upload a secondary form. So this document is completely different. This goes back to my time off request, but I like to just show you a visual of kind of how a formula can work. So on my time off request form, you know, I can enter in like a start date, end date, and I can have a formula calculate the difference in between. If it were other types of fields, like maybe it's a, a reimbursement form where you're having them fill out a bunch of dollar amounts and you want the grand totals or the totals at each end of each line, maybe in a final column to automatically calculate the totals and calculate the tax, et cetera, you can do that with formula fields. So very, very good time saver in making sure that you don't have any mathematical or calculation errors on your document. So what I can do is if I have a couple different text boxes here, and you can calculate formulas based upon text boxes, drop down menus, uh, and even the date signed field. So there's a few different fields that you can leverage formulas with. The thing with formulas though, uh, if you kind of think about it uh, from like a, if you're creating a formula in Excel, for, for instance, uh, you can only write formulas and have it produce a valid formula result if the fields that it's calculating are calculating either numbers or dates, and it's set up with that right logic in mind. So same thing in DocuSign. If you're trying to calculate a field that has text or other special characters that aren't normally included in a formula, like dollar signs, um, or sorry, uh, like uh, decimals, we're not going to be able to calculate that total. So what we need to do first is we need to prep the fields that are going to be calculated, making sure that they're validated to contain only the format that we can leverage in a formula. So what I mean by that in this example, I'm working with dates. 
So I need to make sure that these fields only allow a date format. Otherwise, we can't calculate the total. So over on the right-hand side, what I need to do is I need to give it a data label because, like I said, you can't set up a formula unless you're able to properly identify and write your formula with the correct data labels in mind. So let's call this start date. And under validation, if you remember that, I'm going to go ahead and choose date format only. Now I'm going to do the same thing here for this field. Let's call this one end date. Set that to a date format. Now I'll drag over a formula field, and then over on the right-hand side, under Edit Formula, I'll click Setup. This Learn More link is going to take you to some other documentation, so if you want to learn more about the formula fields, if you have some advanced formulas and advanced logic that you're going to have to really dig into and manage on your templates, very, very highly recommended support article to read through. This takes you through kind of how the formula fields work, how we support standard mathematical operators, we also follow um, the uh, excuse me. We also follow the uh, order of operations, and you can calculate day and date formats. We also have some functions that you can leverage: if functions, floor functions, if you want to round down, how to troubleshoot errors. It also goes through some of the best practices and how you can leverage. Um, oops, where is it at? Uh, just the type of formatting that you have to apply. Yep, right here. So what types of fields can be used in formulas? So like I was mentioning, text fields, date signed, and drop-down fields. And you can also reference formula fields inside other formula fields to create advanced logic. You can also use it to create Boolean logic. So for example, right here, if we add up field A plus field B plus field C, is that less than or equal to 100? So this formula right here would produce either a 1 or a 0. 1 if the statement ends up being true or a zero if it ends up being false for Boolean logic. Okay, so lots of cool things that I do encourage you reading through here. I'm not going to belabor the points on all of these. The one function that, I'm, that you're going to see me using here in just a moment is this date difference function, just to calculate the difference between two different dates. Just going back to my example here. So when I click into this formula field, this is where we're going to write our formula. You'll notice how you have to pick fields, and it's based upon their data label names. So those fields that I didn't add unique data labels to, again, that goes back to the point of why you want to apply data labels that are clear and concise and make sense. So I want to use my date diff function, and we're going to compare the end date, comma, with the start date, and then close the formula by closing the parentheses. And I just simply want to output the total. I don't want to create Boolean logic, so I'm not going to leverage any of these other functions. I don't need to add days to it after I differentiate them. So I'm just going to click into this white space there, get rid of that drop down. And I'm also going to change the decimals to zero because I'm working with dates, not decimal points. And then click Save. So then the way you'd test this is you would go in, send an envelope, and that you would, whatever date we put here and here, it's going to show me the difference in those days. So how many days am I requesting off? Okay, so very easy to set up formulas. Now the other nice thing too that we have is attachment fields. So if you wanted to force or make it optional, it's up to you, uh, that a signer is able to upload an attachment. So maybe it's a copy of their transcript or other documentation that you're requesting. Maybe it's another form that you've spoken with them on the form about and said, hey, when you sign this document, make sure you already have this filled out. You've already scanned it and uploaded it because you're going to be uploading it during your signing ceremony with DocuSign. So what we can do is if we have this right here, the signer can click on it and upload uh, anything that they need to from their machine. So depending upon your administrators, you may or may not have access to this field. Uh, and you may see the behavior change a little bit differently depending upon your admin settings. But this is generally a field that's leveraged by many, many different colleges and universities for various use cases. The other uh, caveat to using this field, though, uh, that I like to point out is that it does leave a little paperclip image icon burned onto your document. So make sure that it's not overlapping text like this that you might need to read in the background when the document is completed. And generally speaking, you want to have it off to the side where it's not going to matter if there's a little black paperclip icon burned at that location. 
The other nice thing is we have a note field. So the note field is great if you need to provide some instructions or context that's not already currently on your document. So in this case, I want the student to upload an attachment of some type, but I don't have any instructions on the document indicating what type of attachment it is. So I want to provide those right next to it. Now, the note field, the great thing about it is that when, this, when the signer is done signing and they click finish, at the end of the day, you might see that paperclip icon right here for the attachment field, but you're not going to see a mark left at all by the note field. It just simply disappears much like when you rip off uh, a sticky note from a document. So over here, I can double click into it and pre-fill it. Or over here on the right hand side, I can pre-fill it over here. Now to make sure it really stands out and grabs their attention, like I said, we don't burn any of this text on your document, so let's make it a little bit wild and make it stand out, grab their attention. So if I go to formatting, let's change the font to something that matches my document, but I'm going to make the font extremely large, make it bold, and let's make it bright red. Okay, That way there's no question about them not being able to read it. <laughs> All right. And then lastly, we have approve and decline. So on this form, I didn't see a spot for any type of approval signature, but yet I assume for most of these types of forms, you do have someone ultimately reviewing it and approving it. it the question is just do you want that approval to happen here in the DocuSign workflow? Maybe you just want to get the completed document, and then after you get it from DocuSign, you then determine what you do with it or don't do with it. It's up to you. So this is really uh, uh, um, a kind of fake scenario, of course, where I might have an approver. If I have an approver and I don't want them actually signing the document, but I do want to deliver it to someone to review, and if they approve it, I want the envelope completed. But if they decline it, it will void the entire envelope. So that's what approve and decline does. Just like the note field, it doesn't leave a mark on your document whatsoever. But if the approver clicked on approve, it would automatically complete their action it would mark the envelope as completed if they're the last person, or it'd route it to the next person if there's other recipients after them. Um, but if they click decline, it's going to give them a warning saying, hey, are you sure you want to decline and void this envelope? Because that's essentially what decline does. Okay, but in some cases, you might want that option. All right. So now I've built out this workflow. I've built out this template. Everything looks good. So now I can go ahead and click save. Oh, all right. Let me delete that other document that I have in here. Click delete. And done. And save and close. So now that I have my template built, at least we're pretending it's built for the most part, uh, I can also organize my templates over here on the left. Now the thing to point out, anything under my template, that's going to be templates that you have created. If you delete a template, be careful because if you accidentally delete it, make sure you take it out of the deleted trash can right away because at midnight of every night, anything that's in your deleted items, whether it's in your, uh, if it's in your envelopes or if it's here in your templates, they will be purged. Shared with me are going to be templates that are created by others that have been shared with you. Or you can click on all templates and just see all the templates you have access to, whether you built it or someone else did and they shared it with you. And you can also, uh, depending upon your admins, you might notice that there could be templates organized by shared folder, either by department or use case name or both. You can have custom folders, and then you can even share out your templates uh, by folder. So when I click on my template name, let me just show you a couple actions, and then uh, here in just a minute we're going to dive right into PowerForms. So if I easily wanted to edit my template any time in the future, or let's just say fast forward a week from now, oops, I need to change this field on my template. I click on Edit. And you return back to the same or excuse me, template creation view where I can modify the document, recipients. On the next page, I can update any of my fields and then save and close. So very easy to go in and edit your template. Now I can also share my template with users on the account or groups. But again, you'll want to defer to your leaders and uh, DocuSign admins in terms of if they want you sharing templates or maybe notify a DocuSign administrator to then share it with other users. 
Under this More dropdown, I can easily clone a template. So if I needed to, need to create a quick variation of this template, I can just simply click Create a Copy. Maybe this version needs to have an additional approver. And we'll call this one Special Exception to Approvers Mandatory. Right? Whatever's going to make it clear for the sender. So now you can see I have two identical templates, except for this new one has one additional approver role. And so, so again, you don't have to recreate the templates from scratch if you need to create a quick new variation. Just simply clone it. Okay, so the last thing I really want to cover on this session is power forms. And we're just going to dive right into it, just given the time right now. So if I click on Create Power Form, very easy. Let me walk you through some of these settings, though. So the Power Form name is just how you identify uh, what URL that you're trying to edit or manipulate uh, for this template. Now, with a template, again, you have to have your template built in advance when you create a Power Form, but you can create as many Power Forms as you want assigned to even one template. So uh, I won't get into all the little nuances there. There's a lot of different things depending upon the use case and the scenario, but you can adjust the name for the individual power forms. Email subject, this is gonna be used, say if we're allowing completion emails to be sent to the signer when they're done, um, or just for you to identify the envelope name if you're tracking those responses in those self-service scenarios. Now, on the PowerForm screen, like you saw earlier when we clicked on the link or simulated it, um, I, was, I, as the student, was able to type in my name. I then typed in uh, someone else's name as the secondary signer and then proceeded to fill out the document. So what we can do here is we can add additional instructions on that first PowerForm screen. So what I can do here is maybe we can say student withdrawal form. Oops, sorry. Okay, so I could say like welcome to the student withdrawal form. Try and make it exciting, right? <laughs> Fill in the name and email below. If oops, if you have any questions, please contact ABC email email dot com. Right? Whatever you want to do. Thank you. So when we click on the link, these are going to be the special instructions that we see on the screen. Now over here on the right-hand side, we have some additional options. What we want to do sometimes for Power Forms is add email validation. And really, in my opinion, this would be a best practice, simply because it prevents a lot of potential abuse. And if you think about it, it makes sense. If I'm a student and I go onto, a, a, onto your website and I click a link for a student drop form, What's going to prevent me from submitting a withdrawal request for another student in my class that I don't like, right? <laughs> I, I kind of think, what if uh, worst case scenario sometimes? So if that's a worry to you, we want to use email validation because what that means is when I click on the PowerForm link, you saw at the very beginning of the call, I as the student would have to type in my name and email. So even if I try and fraudulently put in some other student's email address, in order for me to even fill out the form, I would have to go to that inbox for the email that I provided, copy a unique code, and paste that back on the DocuSign screen proving that I have access to that email inbox. So immediately you're going to alleviate some potential fraudulent abuse with your power forms. But again, you can play with it, determine what's best for your own scenarios, but we do recommend using email validation because not only does it allow for that type of uh, security, um, but it also makes sure that if your signer accidentally closes their browser, they still have a link in their email inbox at that point that they can click on and go back to the envelope to finish it. If you're not using email validation, you risk an envelope being created and it's sitting out there indefinitely, unable to be finished because they closed their browser and they don't have an email with a link to return back to it. So email validation is a good thing. Usage settings means I can limit how many times this power form is used, either by just in general or by the same name and email. 
So limit usage by quantity would mean like if this were a power form, let's just say for like a job application, right? I click on to uh, some department page, maybe for a, a, a faculty opening, and maybe you only want to accept up to 50 applications because you only have one or two positions you want to hire for. Well, why would you allow 1,000 applicants, meaning you're, you've incurred the cost of 1,000 envelopes, when you're only really interested in looking at the first 50 applicants? Well, let's go ahead and set the limit so that when that link is clicked on and people have filled out the document 50 times, even though the link may still be on your website, it's going to be inactive. So that means whoever clicks on it is going to get a message saying that this power form is temporarily unavailable. Limit time between responses would mean that if I know, or if you know that you have a use case where you have a faculty member that needs to go onto the website, click on this power form, fill it out rather frequently, but yet maybe we want to impose some limits, we can say, you know what, we don't want them submitting more than one of these every 60 minutes. Did I hear a question? All right, so I'll go ahead and uncheck these for this example here, and I'm going to go ahead and click Create. And very simply, that creates the Power Form. Again, the Power Form is just a fancy term for a URL assigned to a template for self-service access. So if I click Copy, and let's simulate using this Power Form now by just simply pasting it in my browser. So notice right here, these are those special instructions that I added. So add some personalization to this more um, to this somewhat vanilla screen. But right here, student provides their name, approver, the student will also provide their name, or we could have that hard coded into the template. And if there's a carbon copy, let's just say maybe they want to carbon copy their parent or instructor or something like that, they could certainly do that. Again, every workflow and scenario is going to be different. Now the nice thing here is that if we lock down those recipients in our template, notice how the first recipient is always going to be required. They're what we refer to as the initiator, the person who clicks on a power form and they're initiating the envelope through the power form. But because I lock down those recipient settings in my template, you know, don't allow senders to edit recipient, delete recipient, that's what also made this mandatory. So the student in this case, or the initiator, would be forced to enter in any missing downstream recipients, the ones that are required anyway. Because notice the carbon copy that we left optional, so we allowed it to be deleted if necessary. I don't have those red asterisks next to their name. So what happens here in the self-service application is if I click begin signing without providing a name and email for this optional recipient, we're going to automatically just remove this role from the envelope and no one is going to be carbon copied, or excuse me, no one additional is going to be carbon copied. And then begin signing. Now remember I have validation turned on, so I can't just fill out the document. I need to go to the email address that I provided and copy that code. So let me do that. So here's the code, and here's the link in their email. So if they accidentally close their browser, they can click Resume Signing and jump right back to that same envelope and finish. But I'll paste the code here and validate. And assuming the code is correct, they will now proceed with signing the document. So notice how the conditional logic works. If I click on, let me zoom in a little bit more, sorry. If I click on one of these other options, nothing really happens until I get to other and now that's required. Okay. And we'll maintain the value as well in case they return back to it. Now if I try and let's see how the, I'm sorry, let's just pick a style here. Um, put in my ID, term 20. Here's how the upload attachment works. Uh, I'm just going to pick the same document just for simplicity's sake here. Click Done. And now you can see whatever documents that they upload get appended on to the very end. 
and we'll see this note field disappear in just a moment. But remember, I set requirements for these checkboxes. So if I try and click finish prematurely, I can't. And if I just select one and try and finish, I can't. Because remember, I put validation mandating that I must select all four in order to finish. Very nice. Now you'll notice too, the next thing to point out with Power Forms, and that is also a factor or consideration that you'll probably want to talk with your DocuSign administrator about, administrator about how you want to uh, handle this scenario. So notice the email notification that came to me with that access code or the email validation. It says Jesse Morgan via DocuSign. So that's my name, but the, the question is, well, I didn't send them an envelope. It was self-service. They clicked on a link and they just, got the notification, so why is it coming from my name? And it's good to just be aware of how this works and the why behind it. So for example, if I go back here to DocuSign, let me close this. When you're on your templates, if you click on your template name, it's kind of hidden from view, but notice down here at the bottom it says Associated Power Forms. If I scroll down, here's my Power Form. So the thing you should know is when you create the Power Form, the creator of the Power Form is the one by default listed as the sender for any envelope that's generated through that Power Form link. So if you want those envelopes generated by someone else, you'll need to make sure that you pick a different sender. And the way you do that is we click on Actions, and you can click Change Sender. And so if I wanted to, if I have more of like a service account or a generic user created, and I want those emails branded with human services via DocuSign, or human resources via DocuSign instead of my name, or maybe Dorian's name here, I would need to select them as the sender. And then underneath that user's inbox and sent items in their Manage tab in DocuSign, they would be the ones to see the envelopes in their folders. Now, the reason why we say you need, might need to speak with your DocuSign administrators about this is, number one, what type of user do we want those envelopes being generated under? Is it more of a generic service account user where it's more generic like this, or is it just another named individual? The other thing you need to think about is that if it is more of a service account, what if I, Jesse, need to view those submissions? I don't want those envelopes coming from me under my name but I need access to see those transactions maybe on a daily basis. How can I gain access? We can set this human resources user as the PowerForm sender, and then an administrator can set up what we call folder sharing. So what that means is now I, Jesse, can click on a shared folder, and even though those envelopes are being generated underneath some other user's name, I can still view those transactions. Okay, so those are some considerations, and uh, we'll probably uh, have working sessions to work all that out with, with your team, but uh, just wanted to put that out there just so there's no surprises if you say, hey, I created a power form, why are they coming from me? The other thing to look at is what if you lose that URL you copied? You can simply click on Actions and Copy URL, and you get the same pop-up where you can copy the URL. Or even if you have like a, uh, I've seen some universities or colleges where they have a content management system where, you know, kind of similar to WordPress, where you can add in your own HTML, maybe like in blog posts or wherever. So if you're allowed to modify and embed HTML in your site or you want to give the HTML to your web developer or IT department, this is the HTML. Basically, it's the same link, but it's just already pre-formatted so they can just copy and paste it on the website and it's good to go. I can also edit my PowerForm setting at any time, so I can always adjust email validation or the usage settings. I can deactivate a PowerForm, which is useful if you already have the link on your website and you think to yourself, oh darn, I need to make some template updates, I need to make some changes, so I don't want anyone clicking on that link in the meantime while we're doing some template maintenance. So what I can do is set this to inactive or deactivate it temporarily make my template adjustments by clicking edit, editing my template, saving my changes, and then when I'm ready, I don't have to recreate the power form, and I don't have to give the URL to the web team again. The URL is already on the website. But what I do need to do is go ahead and activate it so that when that link is clicked on again, they're able to use that power form now. 
Uh, last thing is you can delete the power form. That's pretty self-explanatory. All right, so we covered a lot. Uh, we have about 10 minutes remaining. So what I'd like to do is go ahead and open this up for questions. Uh, so feel free to unmute yourselves in the WebEx chat and ask away. I have one question um, on the contact list. What is that? What is that associated with? Would that be a a list of contacts that that ended? You know, I guess uh, you know somebody would have to maintain or create inside DocuSign, or is that associated in any way with maybe a a group of you know maybe a AD list? Are you referring users. to this list right here? Yeah, yeah, I saw that ad from contact. So what what is what what is the source of the contact, the address book? Good question. And I've been uh, an advocate to have this renamed because it's really more of a contact history in DocuSign. Um, so let me describe kind of how it works. Our contact list is not synced with any type of contact directory that you have on your side. Uh, okay. You can't do a mass import or anything of that nature. What it's really designed to do is it's more of a courtesy uh, feature. So if you're sending to uh, frequent individuals um, over time, uh, say over a period of six months, you send to 10 different people named, uh, I like to throw out a fictitious name like Bob. Right? You send to 10 different Bobs over the next six months. Well, every time you go to type in the letters B O B in the name, we're going to give you a little pop-up menu of potential uh, historical contacts that you've sent to, just to save you some uh, keystrokes, so you don't have to retype the same name and email over and over again. You can just simply pick from your list of, oh, hey, I've sent to this person before. This is the person I want to send to. Similar to what you do with email, like if you've ever mm -hmm. sent an email to someone in the two months, right. you go to start typing it in. That's kind of how that works. Now, you can add contacts in advance to your own address book in DocuSign. But the thing to know is that the address book isn't held at the account level, so you wouldn't be adding contacts at the account level for all users. Um, it's more of a user-based feature. Yeah. So, so it's individual uh, user's contact. Precisely, yep. Okay. Yeah, good question. Anyone else have any questions? We covered a lot. I, I know there's got to be some burning questions out there. <laughs> so you touched on one of those last topics, um, the service account possibly, the human re resources. So if I understood correctly, you could have human resources as the default sender. Correct but not necessarily use that service account to create your your form or your templates. Bingo. Okay. It's mainly it mainly is used or that concept uh, of how to use more of like a generic service account uh, is mainly used in context of more from like a branding standpoint. Um, so like if someone clicks on a self-service link on your site to fill out something like this withdrawal request, and they see an email notification come from Jesse, and they're thinking to themselves, who the heck is Jesse? I just clicked on a link on the website to fill out this form. Right. <laughs> um, so maybe instead you want that email notification coming from student services via DocuSign right. or right. UTGRV uh, via DocuSign. It, right? it would be a, a email that will, will uh, accept responses and that there's a group behind it that can see those. Is that correct or no? Yes. Uh, so the email notification would be, because uh, essentially what you're doing is when we say a service account, it's really a user on your account, but we just, you, or rather, you would give it the full name of more of a generic name as opposed to a real person name, person's first and last name. Um, but but does yeah, it, have it, to does have to be, it does have yeah. to be affiliated with an email address that can't right. receive okay. emails because you would have to activate them as a user. Right. Um, the other thing to consider is that the recipient, so in my case here, if I go back to my email, as the student looking at this, if I go ahead and click reply, you can see here the email address goes mm -hmm. to the uh, sender's email. 
Right. You want to make sure there was some sort of situation in place where you could be monitoring that inbox to, you know, just in case someone replies to an email notification and can right. respond to it. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Anyone else? Bueller? <laughs> <laughs> well, then. It sounds like we are going to give you five minutes back to your day. Time is precious. <laughs> so thank you, everyone, for, um, for being engaged and asking questions. And we look forward to seeing you in a couple weeks for the admin sessions. And if you have any questions, Esther, let me know. And we will bid you adieu. Will do, Carrie. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, bye -bye. everyone. Have a great day. Bye-bye.